I did something uh, this last weekend that I have not done since March of 2020. Did you go to a bar? <clears throat> yes. Uh, myself and uh, a few <laughs> uh, fellow fully vaxxed friends went and sat outside at a patio and had some drinks. Um, and we had a lovely time. Um, it, the part that was not lovely uh, was that it, I think it was Friday night and everybody, or no, it was Saturday night and everybody was doing it. And we couldn't find a bar that wasn't like jam packed and scary. So, and so the only place where we could find, so we wound, we wound up at that- uh, Zebra Club? What's, no, that whack bar, <laughs> the new one by Kupros or the newish one, I guess. Oh, the, the cabin. cabin. Yeah, like that yeah. Chud bar where like, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's just an awful bar. But it was I like know, the only yeah. one that wasn't like crazy packed. So that's where- I didn't we know they had outdoor seating. They put it. They in are one of the of people who Rona. built like a whole patio, like in the bike lane on Twenty First. So they have like a bunch of uh, outdoor, which is actually oh. kind of cool to their credit. Um, but yeah, anyway, so my story is it? not about this. My story is that my the 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 thing that I didn't realize that I was missing that I realized when I was out there that I had been missing it the entire time was watching. Uh, like 21 year olds just completely eat shit on those scooters as they bomb down the sidewalk at like yeah. 100 miles an hour i saw we saw two different people in the span of like two hours just like eat it real hard uh riding those uh which i love to see and not because i like to see people having a bad time or i'm a sadist who enjoys uh watching other people in pain uh -huh. uh, it's True. because every time i see that happening it's always because it's some idiot riding down the sidewalk when there's like a giant bike lane right there like we were talking 21st street we were talking j street with a protected bike lane like a big green one where there's parked cars in between you and the moving cars that are scary um as somebody who's been cycling around Sacramento for years, I have absolutely no sympathy for people who are scared to ride those scooters in the street. And if you bomb past me on one of those things, like at full speed and then eat it, I will openly laugh at you as you lay in the intersection and like try and figure out how to process the amount of embarrassment and pain you are now feeling out, out of nowhere. Skylar actually I carries a twigs in his pocket and then as he sees <laughs> mm -hmm. people come by on those jump scooters, he just tosses twigs out. S <laughs> spike strip from yep. the bar. Yeah. The, we actually That's have a, a good idea. You know, show. if you could make one out of those, like I saw on Breaking Bad, you could do like a hose and just drive some nails through a hose and just kind of toss it out there when people yeah, come by. Dope. Roll no, it out. no, and no. And this is especially <laughs> alarming to me because I was literally out this weekend with my in laws riding around town. But on not the on sidewalks. We we were on scooters. There were there was only maybe one time we were on the sidewalk, and that was in part because there's not a bike lane on that street, and it was really Fine. narrow. Fine. And so you so, but I'm just saying, like for the most part, we tried to ride in the bike lane and do our thing on the street. But I don't. I still we're talking think, about so the people only spike on strips on the streets that have bike lanes. I think that's, that's all. Compromise. I will. I I will yeah. allow. And, yeah. Okay. And, that's fair. I don't, I don't. We actually don't have a good it. friend of the show who broke their arm. I, I don't want to name them. I don't want to make them embarrassed, but. Um, Were they on the sidewalk? A former, a former guest broke their <laughs> uh, scooting once. On after a, a night of a few drinks. Yeah. Pardon me while I go wow. to google.com and look at all Thanks. of our guests. <laughs> Shannon, look into this immediately. Right. What is this episode one hundred and fifty-seven? I'm sorry, I have to take this night off. <laughs> now, PSA: um, If you ride those things, I, you know, I don't, I don't like hate those things necessarily right out the gate. But if you ride them on the sidewalk and then you crash, I, I think it's okay to laugh. At, it's yeah, okay for it, people to laugh at your pain. The weekenders are the worst, and often they're coming from off the central grid of the city. They don't know the protocol. They don't know the rules of the road with them, and it tends to make things a little more annoying. But I do. I'm perfectly fine with folks who know how to use a scooter, know what the rules are. And, like, I think I just read the city wrote a little piece on their PR website that 
they people have put in some like 2.3 million miles on these things since the uh since yeah. just before the the pandemic so i mean better that than you know gas guzzling yep yeah but just don't be coming like bombing down uh, not only the sidewalk here's another one don't be riding down one-way streets the wrong way in the bike lane. stay off my lawn oh i Okay, that's really fair. hate that. But I still don't want you to harm Spike people. strip time I, for you. No, no, no. <laughs> for no. you. See, see, this is the problem. This is the problem. We can't be abolitionists and then replace Create, this with creating harm. Wanting to do harm to people who don't do what we like. Like this is not right this now. This is not, called this is called teaching people consistent. lessons. We're, this we're is called, it sounds like restorative to me. Yeah, I think gang gang to me right now and i think maybe that's not our best look today that's all i'm saying it's like we somehow or another we made a hard right into a brick wall and we I should wanna... replace the carceral state with homemade spike strips is all that i'm saying and i, I think that that's i think that's this is a legitimate different. and free met free yeah medicare for all Yes. So if yeah, you do, so that you can get medical attention mm -hmm. afterwards mm -hmm. restore and you can yeah, get the free you can get free um you you can get um like free mental health care as well um right, that right. hopefully puts you in a place where you don't feel like you need to ride down the wrong side of a one way street while I'm coming up the right way on my bike and then look at me like I'm the asshole. Public How health is win. This any different than Spikes. than our current situation where the state inflicts harm on people and then we say oh but we have these jails and prisons to rehabilitate you and to provide you with all these services like i don't understand how this is different this is extremely different for reasons no, that are far too numerous for me to count right now no, on not. this podcast this is too it's too nuanced it's and too we're just different. we're in an <laughs> opener we don't have the time <laughs> yeah, this also, this can't be its own segment. So I we're recognize right. Recognize that, that this and... may be just a point of departure for me and Skylar once we get to the point where we abolish the current system that he and I have to part ways because his you know username is guillotine for you. So I mean, there's only so far we can go. <laughs> I'm willing to I'm willing to change and bend. I'm willing to expand. Like I'm willing to introduce spikes into their spikes running with for the guillotines you. and I'm stuff not. yeah I, i'm I, for I, you Spike strip for you right the, the u.s doesn't negotiate with terrorists and i'm not negotiating with violence in this way so see you know I, honestly if we need departure. speaking of terrorists if we want to get to that segment we got to start the show now we do okay let's right. do it spike strips no. Voices, the things they said. Voices, some from those days. All the voices heard. Voices, the things we say. Voices, they're in your head. All the voices heard. To hello everyone, you have Kempa, and you have Spike Strip. <laughs> and Shannon, and you have an abolitionist here, a truly committed abolitionist named Flo. Spike Strip is a good nickname too. I love that. Well, before the show, Shannon mentioned that the art on the wall too, and when I hopped on the screen, she said, "Oh, it's the nipple." And Skylar thought that that was her nickname for me. Got it. Which another good nickname, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great nickname. Yeah, maybe when you know down the road, if we like revamp this show, we'll <laughs> without Shannon and Flo, we'll re rebrand it as Nipple and Spike Strips. Yeah, <laughs> morning Spike Strip and the Nipple. <laughs> Your morning drive. Aouga. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to free the nipple, but I do not support Spike Strip. So I'm going to start the campaign to get him removed from the show. That's that's oh, the wow. point. We're provocative, you know. That's right. We keep everybody yeah. on their toes. Yeah. Or off them after they run over a Spike Strip and <laughs> crash. <laughs> and there we or go. we make sure everyone's toes are <laughs> broken. Right on brand. Right on brand. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got a lot of, to cover today. Um, so let's get right to it. Uh, let's begin with uh, what a week for SAC PD. Uh, Skylar, can you introduce some of, of what's been going down over on their end ever since 
uh, Howard Chan tried to throw 35, $30.5 million more their way in this coming year? Yeah, they're getting in trouble. Uh, which I was, I almost was like, oh, they're messing up. But that's not really the story here because they're always messing up. The story here is that they right. are actually facing consequences. Um, we have two cops uh, who are in trouble right now. Yep. Uh, one of them, Alexa Palubicki, I think is how you would pronounce that name, uh, was arraigned this morning, yeah, uh, for filing a false report uh, over a stop that she made uh, under dubious, for dubious reasonings, and then conducted a search that was not legal. It's my understanding, yeah. Yeah, she, uh, she and I think another officer started hassling this young man and they uh, came up with a fake reason to to rifle through his car they found a gun uh, but as we are seeing they've since found that their reasoning for going through his car was false the funny thing to me is like cops do that all the time right Right. Well, and the things that they said, I don't like I'm I actually would like to know and I'd be interested if, if any of you know the the reasons why they gave for pulling him over in the first place is because he turned into a gas station without using a turn signal and they were they thought that he might possibly be under the influence was the reason they gave that apparently later on was found to be fraudulent. I want to know how how anyone that seems like a he said she said situation to me and whenever it's he said she said with the cops it's always whatever the cops say is is what we go with right so i don't i guess fully understand how that came to pass i don't know either and i you know what this there was um another story in the b that talked about the the way that these decisions were made was that she had consulted her fiance who was also an officer like on the as she was making the call to like search the vehicle so so there was the initial like decision to search the vehicle because i'm sorry to pull over this person because they were potentially under the influence and then in order to actually gain access to the vehicle she had consulted with another officer on the who I do not was not on the scene but was on duty which was her fiance um and that like they had this is how they came up with the this person might have a a firearm right Mm-hmm. Well, they, they, they it says up. they refuse to allow to consent to a search of his vehicle multiple times, and then eventually they just ignore it and do it, and that's when they find this gun in his backpack or whatever. I guess they could have seen it on like maybe a on like maybe the dash cam. I don't know. I'm like speculating, but it's right. like I mean, that that's... would that would disprove if he is if he does have his blinker on, and they say that he doesn't, and that is evidence to the contrary. I guess sure. I, I, I mean, the crux of it, yeah, they she lied on the report they have evidence for how and why that happened either through this phone call with her partner or by the video dash cam um i guess i'm again just like i feel like this happens all the time with cops i don't know why sac pd is currently now trying to say that they prosecute their cops but um Mm -hmm. if they keep doing this case i guess let's see this continue to happen i'm worried about this actually um and I know that that might not be the the popular take on this, but I'm worried that this is like, you know, there's there's a way when you're doing like racial equity work where you talk about how, you know, yes, of course, the carceral system, right, is designed to create a permanent underclass using race and ethnicity as its basis, right? But it will also sacrifice some white people in service of that, right? Um, Usually poor white people, right? And so I'm just worried that right now what the system is doing is realizing that it's nearing a tipping point and just kind of like throwing some people under the bus that they know because the, the issues run deep but throwing some people on the, under the breast in a high profile way to be able to let off some of the steam right. and to build on the like 
Chauvin goes to prison. We're rounding up bad cops. See, we can do our thing and we can police ourselves. So you should give us more money and keep things as they are, right? Like it, it, the glaring, you can only do the glaring, glaringly obvious like things for so long before popular opinion goes against you. And so then you have to find more covert ways of being able to keep your system going. And I'm just worried that this is going to feed into a CSAC PD will re right. you know, right. <laughs> crack down on their own, right? The folks who want to like go back to brunch on this issue will yep. after yep. this, right? That, yep. And I think like, I, I do, I think there's a couple of things here that support that theory. For one, uh, this uh, Alexa officer is 26 years old. Um, the next one we're going to get to is a 30 year old. So you have to imagine that these are fairly new people who are fairly new to the force, um, who don't have super long careers and who pe people don't, I have to imagine the powers that be probably don't feel like they owe them as much of like having their back or whatever due to them being newer cops yeah well let's talk about this other one too um but like i think you're both right uh and i think what's happening now is a direct response to the pressure that you know you the listener has been putting on city council and also on city manager howard chan and also on police chief daniel han they're finally saying oh oh no we have to do something in response to this this next one i believe it was uh was it the day before um yeah was this is so justin the, david the day Shepherd. after the, yeah, the day after Paulo Biki's arrest, uh, SAC PD announced that the arrest of another officer on domestic violence charges. Um, so yeah, his name's Justin David Shepherd. Shepherd, um, and yeah, so now we've got he well, was a four, three year so he's veteran. On, he's in on four felony counts. His case is a little different and a little more uh, severe, I think. So mm -hmm. he's facing four felony accounts. Um, arrested on suspicion of corporal injury on a spouse or cohabitant uh, with uh, domestic violence, uh, false imprisonment, making criminal threats against a victim of death or great bodily injury, and making a threat with a gun, according to jail records. Uh, again, something that, to my understanding, is just sort of par for the course for how cops uh go about their marriages but i mean here we go um this guy got busted also uh as i'm sure somebody would like to uh to take the ball and dunk on this uh this guy is a recent sacramento cop rogues gallery uh guy right yeah uh oh, dave right. do you remember this gentleman this uh this officer shepherd um from a story that we covered on this show uh fairly recently yeah our our this was one of our iconic early episodes cop shoots dog mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. wherein we told the story of how a man sitting outside safeway was harassed by sac pd they were they basically told him he had x amount of time to move and as he was getting ready to move they just went in on him and his dog was defending him and they shot his dog and it ran into the safeway uh where uh patrons of the safeway actually took care of the dog thankfully it lived but long story short also didn't a piece it, of that bullet like bounce off the ground and stick in the guy's leg too or something do i remember that correctly I don't remember that um that was part of it yeah I thought it bounced in the ground and hit the dog. Yeah, I could be oh. remembering it incorrectly. Because I think we'd be talking about him being shot instead, if that were the case. Um, but the basically, the, the city had to pay uh, $99,000 of uh, your tax dollars uh, to uh, this man for the officer's behavior. I know he was this. So At least it was $100,000. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was right. Just under. Just this guy was named in that case uh, as a defendant. I'm not sure if, if we. It know was him that was... pulled the trigger. Yeah, yeah, he was there though. I think when they. When yeah, it yeah, yeah. Um. So you know, again, this is a whole pattern of behavior by SAC PD, and in which they're finally saying like, "Oh, now, now we will, will, will go down hard against these folks." When I feel like they would be probably surreptitiously finding ways to defend him after something like this can we also talk about the bail that 
the bond that was set for this officer who, uh, you know, Skyler read the charges. Um, it was a $50,000 bond that he was released from the Sacramento County main jail um, on, on Friday night. And we have talked, we have spoken of on this show over and over and over again, bail charges that are attached to oh, protesters mm-hmm. for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Just, just so, so many more thousands of dollars than a $50,000 bond for a cop who is, um, you know, falsely imprisoning people, making criminal threats against a victim of death or great bodily injury and making a threat with a gun. Yeah, I mean, I think that just goes to show that if you if you are somebody who feels compelled to go get um, in the street and participate in civil unrest, what you should do instead is hork down 14 Bud Lights put your badge down, uh, beat your wife up real bad, get your gun out, point it at her and threaten to kill her. Um, and you will have an easier time getting out of jail than if you had just gone and gotten in the street. At least you'll do it for cheaper. Yeah. And this, I don't know, and maybe you all have a, a take on this, but um, right after this piece talks about the bond. It talks about how California law prohibits any person to be a police officer after a domestic violence conviction. Um, and that conviction Shepherd, being the key word there, right? That Shepard has been placed on administrative leave and stripped of his peace officer powers as the administrative and criminal process continues, according to the police department. Um, yeah. I would, I suspect that it's infrequently that, a police officer is convicted on charges that would cause them to lose their job. I mean, there's a study that gets pointed to all the time. There's a study that gets pointed to all the time. That's like something like 40% of police officers will admit to like domestic being domestically violent against their spouses And I think that's the ones who will be like, yeah, I do that, right? When asked for a study. Um, I don't know. I can't name the study, so I I cannot verify the veracity of this claim. But 40% seems to be about the accepted number of these guys who are apparently beating the crap out of their fucking We should look into this if we're going to throw that number out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I also... Um, just the last thing in, in this piece that I think like I want to call out is police chief Daniel Hahn says in the news release about I this, love this. I love this. Take it away. <laughs> says in the news release about this um, officer who has been who allegedly has done all of the aforementioned things um, that the Sacramento Police Department does not and never will tolerate criminal behavior from our officers. Hell yeah. I believe that. We demand that our officers uphold the highest legal and ethical standards that are required to serve our community in the critical position of peace officer. We hold our officers to these standards both on and off duty and will continue to work with the victim in this case. I mean, I don't know. Call this a wild take, but Sacramento PD is has not established itself as a space that holds officers to the highest legal and ethical standards as black and brown folks continue to not only be terrorized by police just by their mere presence in our community at any given moment, but as people are killed in their backyards in the middle of a mental health episode um, while they're, you know, walking down the street essentially like that's a bunch of bullshit no of course and like again i i guess all four of us we we know this pretty well on the show i i don't know how much more time we need to spend on this other than the fact that okay now they're charging people with things fine but let's see where this actually goes sure um one thing i'd like to talk about because we do have to keep moving um you know uh our city now has 
you know, we have for years had our oversight commission that, you know, despite all of their great ideas, um, I'm, I'm watching Flo's dog right now and I can't focus. Just get so comfortable. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad he's making a bed. I thought he was going to go another route. I thought that pillow. looked like he was going to hump the pillow. Yeah, yeah I definitely yeah, thought that was going to get. He's not really a humper. He's more of a ch- he's more of a chiller. Okay. Like he's to looking for freaky. a place to lay down and to make himself as comfortable as possible. Okay, um, so we have had a police commission for years, or, or oversight committee, or whatever you want to call it, but they haven't had teeth, and city council hasn't adopted a thing of what they have recommended until council member Valenzuela forced the force uh, item onto the, onto the agenda last week. Now we are seeing that the sheriff's department uh, on our county level, um, that our board of supervisors is creating another Sheriff's Oversight Commission, uh, you know, uh, made up of the citizens of the county. Flo, what are you thinking about this? Does this have any teeth? I mean, generally speaking, none of these have any teeth. <laughs> so I think we need to just start there, right? Like, um, I, I mean, we just haven't seen any of them actually have any real like ability to be able to, you know, make decisions, but I firmly believe in the bully pulpit. Um, and so part of the reason why I like them ha- at them existing is because I think there's, you know, the basement and the balcony of what you can do with any position of influence. Um, and I think that there's a lot that can happen. I'm looking at, you know, the city of Sacramento right now and having considered these use of force rec- recommendations that they would not have developed on their own. Like, let's be super clear here, right? Like, does if this commission doesn't exist, we're not even having the conversation to talk about whether or not this is the best or the worst of things. And so I think that's where the value comes in because there's a political pressure that you can put on if you form this thing and they actually use their power and now they're they're rolling back, you know, the mayor's memo, um, which came out last week after the the city was considering this change in um, in the use of force. Uh, the council passed that measure on Tuesday and now apparently they're planning to roll that back and just take the commission's recommendations is what I heard on the um, police commission meeting this evening at six. So, you know, again, I think these are examples Monday evening. Yes. Um, So I think these are examples of, you know, there being political pressure, there being legislative council doing reviews of things and then them coming to the table and having to negotiate in ways that they wouldn't if these if these official bodies didn't exist. So that's why as much as I feel like they are an exercise in futility, I also support their existence. Okay. Um, let's bring it to the, the next step then too, because you know I, I think that that's a really great point on the bully pulpit. I think uh, we have seen you use the bully pulpit uh, to great effect, even though you know your commission doesn't have the legislative power that um, that we would have wanted it to, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I that totally makes sense. Uh, I think another thing that again we've talked about this a lot in the past that we can continue to fight for that can really have a, a good of a, 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 an ameliorative effect on the community is by taking money away from these police forces and actually putting it toward the community. Uh, we just saw, I believe it was on Monday of this week, Council Member Valenzuela putting out her sort of pushback against uh, the city's initial budget recommendations for this next coming year. We all know that they are trying to add, you know, what, what is it, $30 million to the, the mm-hmm. police force. Um, and she is fighting back and saying, no, let's take that $30 million and put it towards a few different things. Here, she tweeted... Does anybody have this? I have it right here if you want. Yeah. What what, what is she offering up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, line one is reduce the police budget by $30.5 million. Uh, This would bring the department uh, to 2019 to 2020 spending level. Um, With that $30.5 million, uh, the first order would be to increase Department of Community Response funding by $6.5 million. This would bring the non cop public uh, emergency response. 
This like would bring the total department first. budget to $10 million to provide necessary prog uh, programmatic support for implementation of the citywide master plan for homelessness. Then we move on to increase youth funding by $10 million. Uh, the mid-year budget appropriated $6 million for youth programming, and we received applications for four times that amount. Our youth desperately need programming and support as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. The next one is fund emergency housing assistance, $10 million. Uh, this would include $1 million for a revolving loan fund to assist low-income homeowners with code compliance issues $4 million in legal aid support for tenants under the Tenant Protection Program and $5 million in crisis funding for homelessness prevention to be administrated, uh, be administered, excuse me, by SHRA. Uh, then we have fund small business. I'm, I don't Ombudsman. know what this word is. <laughs> Ombudsman. Ombudsman, sorry. Fund small business Ombudsman for $1 million. This new office would help support small businesses as they navigate funding opportunities, permitting, and other city services. Then we have public works match funding for another $1 million. This would help support grant applications for traffic and safety improvements. Then we have public restroom upgrades for $2 million. This would help support outdoor community events as well as ongoing community needs. Great. Uh, one thing that stands out to me, public works, works match funding. This sounds like spike strips and I'm totally behind it. Mm -hmm. um, I should but, apply for a grant for that, actually, if that's what this is about. And there sounds mm -hmm. like there's about to be a million dollars for it. So if there's well, a whole well, million. Yeah. How many? Yeah. How many? How much hose can you get from that? That's a, mm -hmm. we're going to find a lot of hoses and, nails. Of hose and spikes. Um, but let's so Flo, you know, you you work pretty pretty closely on the people's budget. Um, and I know that uh, you all meet directly before our episodes on Mondays. So I was wondering if you had some input on on your reflections on on Katie's proposal here. Yeah, so um, Katie's proposal obviously came out like <laughs> six or seven hours ago. So um, we as a committee haven't, you know, fully, you know, f worked it out. Um, but we like what we've seen, um, certainly. Uh, we, you know, all of the things are in alignment with the things that we're really interested in seeing happen, um, including, you know, the Office of Community Response being able to, to um, you know, deflect some of that money away from, from PD, taking PD back down to the last time they got there. I mean, they've gotten a, an increase every year in recent years. And so taking them back to just, you know, two budgets ago is not asking too much. Um, and, you know, I'm really thinking about where we need those resources. Um, I'm especially, you know, excited about the idea of looking at our restroom facilities because one of the things that just seems so egregious to me is that we are sitting here in a pandemic and we have bathrooms throughout the, the city that don't have, you know, water in them. Um, don't have a place to be able to wash your hands and to be able to, to flush the toilet. Like there's just something that's really inhumane about that. In addition to the fact that half the time they're locked up and they don't have toilet paper and they don't have soap and they don't have the things that are needed. And it's just like, it's gross in a regular way. And it's so dehumanizing to reduce people who have to use our public facilities to facilities that are so subpar. Like none of us would want to live in a place that, that had basically a glorified hole in the ground. And so the idea that that's all we offer is just unconscionable, but layering that on top of a global pandemic is like, this is d outright dangerous. And so I think this is a great example of something that we can do very reasonably to make sure that like, you know, like human beings are offered the dignity and respect and protection that they deserve. And hand washing is the least of what we can offer to people. So um, I was really excited to see that in there because I, like I said, I'm a housed person who has potable water at home. And I have been caught out in places where I needed to use a public facility and thought to myself, this is just absolutely unconscionable. Yeah. Shannon, um, I mean, to, to Flo's point, I read this and I see a number of items that directly uh, would positively affect, I think, a lot of the, the folks you're serving today. Um, you know, the increased uh, community response funding, 
um, so that uh, cops aren't hassling folks who are living uh, without housing. Um, the emergency housing assistance, obviously, uh, which that's how you end homelessness is give people housing. And then, uh, yeah, and then the public restroom upgrades. What, do you, what are you thinking about this, Shannon? I mean, I think anytime we see a budget proposal that includes pulling money into spaces that are going to uh, help support the most vulnerable in our community, then we're seeing a good proposal, right? Like, and I think specifically because this is pulling money away from police who have been tasked inappropriately by the city of Sacramento over and over and over again to provide social services, um, like, you know, going out and responding to mental health calls, for example, like this, it's not, we don't want to see a cop pull up in the middle of a mental health crisis. So um, I think certainly being able to fill out that department of community response of course and but i guess my one my one question about that is what is happening with the money that is allocated to that department currently how is that money being used what's being left on the table because that department has not been fully staffed out um and how do they intend to make the most of an increase of $6.5 million in the next fiscal year. Um, and then I have the same question about emergency housing assistance. I think what ends up happening so often is that money ends up left on the table or inappropriately allocated for lack of staffing or lack of like appropriate management. So how are we gonna see like the this money that is being proposed to increase these spaces be used to its like to its maximum so that the most people can be served because we know what's going to happen is an influx of people experiencing homelessness as people are running out of unemployment and money and and you know can't can't catch up with the rent bills that they've been accruing over the last 13 months of the or 14 months of the pandemic so um and I agree with everything Flo said about public restroom upgrades. It's a shame and a disgrace for this community that there has been no effort or energy put towards upgrading or even making sure that those public restrooms function. Um, and it's specifically in spaces where you find a heavy concentration of people experiencing homelessness that you find public restrooms that are, that are just not taken care of. So it's a direct harmful action against poor people to not provide them with toilets and yeah. running water to wash their hands, especially during a pandemic, as Flo mentioned. So we've got positive responses to this proposal. Uh, I guess the big question for me is, does this get any respect uh, from city council does everyone not named Katie Valenzuela or my vein uh, give this a second look? Probably not, but mm. uh, but but I also think that there there probably are some things in there. What will happen is they won't want to cut the police budget, but they will want to try to find ways to fund some of these other things. And so I think that's what's going to end up happening, right? Because, he, I mean, you know, the mayor created the Office of Community Response. And then, but then at the same time, specifically said, I'm not going to take money away from the police. So he was like, we're just going to keep spending more money on things, but we're not going to stop giving the police money. We're just also going to get right. Like he is from this old school mentality that you try to find a middle road and try to please every, as many people as possible instead of voting your conscience and doing the right thing. Um, and so I think that's probably what's more likely to happen is, you know, Daryl is one of those like spend it all and spend money we don't even have if it means that I get to say I won the day. And so I have a feeling that's what he'll do is say, well, what if we, well, what, I can see him up there, you know, gesticulating already. Well, what if we do this and then we put money here and then we do this and then we do that. And it's like, we have a hundred million dollars and you just spent 150. Like what, what are you doing? Right. But that's, that's how he'll try to get by. And then yeah. he'll make the city manager's office have to, on the back end, figure out what's going to be cut or what's right. going to be scaled back to make all of this work. 
but he's not going to bother himself with those level of details. That's just not his style. His style is to do the thing that makes him look the best. And that doesn't anger the high profile people who have to contribute to his future campaigns. The rich folks who have capital. Is that what I'm hearing? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But you'll get your office of community response and you'll probably get an additional four or five million dollars to go to that to bring it up to 10, but you're not getting a police cut. That's just, mm -hmm. that's not right. going anywhere. Daryl's going to well, kill that before it even came out of Katie's mouth, unfortunately. But we're going to rally behind it and we're going to fight the good fight. But I just, I don't know what it's going to take to be able to tip the other people who like their interests over the line to be able to say, we really do need to cut this. This is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, I, I think the only thing that happens is we rally around them and make it so hard for them to conceive of doing this that maybe just maybe there's a chance that it doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, if folks want to uh, be a part of this and try and help, uh, you know, move, move that, that ball forward. Uh, if you are listening on Tuesday morning, there is a budget and audit committee today at 10 a.m. Um, it's the first public meeting on the budget. And so you can go and uh, make your public comment there and be a part of this and, and tr try and help shape the narrative in a way that, um, that Daryl does not want you to and neither do most other people up on that dais. All right, should yeah, we move on? Okay. The only other thing I would say to that is people, but people's budget is going to have a bunch of activities um, and events coming up, including an open meeting on Monday, May 17th from 630 to 730 to just help you. If you're a person who's like, I kind of know money comes in and money goes out, but I don't know much about the budget. You are in very good company. Most people don't know anything about budgets. Um, I've learned over time about budgets. And so we're going to be doing a budget 101 during that open meeting to just kind of help you prepare to maybe sit in on some of these upcoming events and just like, what is the vocabulary? And what does this mean? And what is a fiscal year? And all of those kinds of things, we're going to break all of that down because um, I sometimes think they do that on purpose to make it hard. So more people can't participate because it it's it's complex, but it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, so please feel free to join us. And then there will also be a, a press conference on Tuesday um, to release the response to the budget and talk a little bit through what we're thinking and what we've seen in our survey. So more to come. Um, there'll be lots of watch parties for things coming up with the budget, especially around the city. So we'd love for you to join People's Budget SAC and all of those budget related activities. Love it. I can't say enough about people's budget. Um, and I've got a, a couple of folks I know who've signed up for it. And, you know, like you don't know too much about a budget or, or the ins and outs of it. But, um, but this is, this is how you fight back, I think. And this is a really uh, exciting time to, to become a part of it. Cool. Well, let's just, um, move on to one final little topic. This was one I threw out to the group today. Uh, that there is a man by the name of Joseph Dibby, 53-year-old, uh, who is a former fugitive. Uh, he's been all over the place. He lived in uh, Syria. I think he lived in Russia. Um, he was caught in 2018 in Cuba as he was flying home to, to his family in Russia. And he is accused in a 2001 eco-terror case. Uh, he's pleading not guilty in Sacramento court. Um, I wanted to bring this one up uh, because this sort of touches on a lot of what we've been discussing in recent months on the use of terms like terror and when it is acceptable and not acceptable to use it. Uh, in the 90s, we had a number of groups that were, you know, again, our FBI liked to call them eco-terrorists, where they would go in and sabotage uh, some sort of machinery that was uh, negatively affecting the environment, or they would uh, burn down a logging factory, you know, something like that, uh, knowing full well that it was an effective way to protect the natural environment in those areas, because capital will not the only logic of capital is more capital. So if you're burning down these buildings, 
they're looking at the bottom line and saying, you know what, it's not worth it to rebuild this entire uh, infrastructure, all this machinery again. Um, the other side it, of that too, just to like kind of drive this point home is that like we're also like these, like let's say let's just do logging. Like the logging industry goes in and like, and and puts a bunch of campaign resources towards the politicians who can actually govern in ways that would help out in those situations, but then won't because the way that our political system works is that the people with all the money give some of that money to the government and the government governs in their favor over ours, right? And so I think there's a certain certain groups of people who are very serious about the environment begin to feel like they can't really work within the parameters of the legal system because the legal system is quite obviously and openly rigged against them right and so people get desperate and then you know somehow somewhere a fire might might happen right there's a fascinating documentary on this actually it's called if a tree falls i highly recommend that um for anyone interested in sort of uh, this storyline, this sort of, you know, eco-terror, right? Um, so anyway, uh, it, it is alleged in this case that this guy was a part of this uh, group uh, they called The Family and that they uh, performed a, a number of, of things uh, like this, like we've just been describing. One of the most interesting uh, was the Cavill West a Belgian owned facility in Redmond that killed thousands of horses over the years, packing the meat for export to Europe. Apparently this Belgian owned facility, what was happening is government employees of the Bureau of Land Management were, were buying um, uh, not wild horses, because I don't think that exists, uh, feral horses uh, out, you know, from, from out in, throughout the Western US, selling them to this facility for profit. And then these horses would be slaughtered and brought to, to Europe, right? Mm -hmm. um, this facility is no more uh, and because of something that happened in the 90s. And obviously, that's a deeply sort of immoral kind of disgusting thing that was going on there. Um, but then, of course, uh, the FBI came out, uh, you know, in the post 9-11 world. So after 2001, terrorist was the word that we were all hearing. And they came after these, uh, these, uh, these activists claiming they were terrorists, using that term very heavily and, you know, really hitting people hard with, uh, with somewhat draconian uh, prison sentences. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that these interests of capital, um, these for-profit endeavors started banging the drum, going towards the government and saying, hey, this is terrorism. Oh, my God. Like, you know, the, the American economy is going to tank if we keep letting people do this. So to me, it's a really interesting story. Um, you know, obviously, they don't, people committing acts like this are not killing anybody. They are not uh, physically harming people. They are doing damage to property. And I th think that speaks pretty interestingly to the conversations we've been having in recent weeks on um, you know, our demonstrators in our region. We have our mayor, everyone else calling them terrorists. We have our, our chief of police doing that. And so what does that mean? What does that mean as far as public perception of these folks goes, and as far as what you know, a uh, a sentencing or bringing charges against somebody, what that will look like? Does that result in actual prison time for something like vandalism, simple vandalism? Um, so I don't know. What are our thoughts on this? Uh, <laughs> I, sorry, okay. I have. <laughs> I feel like I have so many. Um, I mean, I think if we're just taking this, like the story that we read about Joseph Dibby, which is like the um, article that you sent on him is fascinating. I was, I felt I was at the edge of my seat the entire time. The Oregon um, public broadcasting one, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I thought it was super well done. Um, but we're looking at this, this person who, yeah, has, has, um, 
his life has taken a trajectory of now being on house arrest in Seattle, right? For uh for something that happened many, many, many years ago, like 23 years ago or something. Um when he's and- only on house arrest, they let him out because he got COVID and also got jumped right. by an inmate so badly that he needed his jaw, uh, he needed jaw surgery. Right. Which is why they let him out. He'd still be he'd otherwise still be he'd still be there. Yeah. locked up. I mean, this guy's life is completely turned upside down for property damage. It just doesn't seem I mean, my take is what? It doesn't seem to me like it's I will we will like I will always stand that violent that like if you are the person who says violence equals property damage then you're wrong and sorry about it yeah i mean in that piece and sorry i i cut out so let me know if you already said this but in this piece does doesn't merrick garland yeah say yeah pretty explicitly that that is not terror yeah uh, the new what is the, yeah? What is his exact definition? Because he Merrick Garland has like a specific way that he defines it. Yeah, Garland. So he was pressed um, to they. They were asking him, and he is he prosecuted Timothy McVeigh, right? One of the most famous domestic terrorists right. in U.S. history. Yep. Um, so during his confirmation hearing, uh, Garland was asked whether attacks on government property like the federal courthouse in Portland constituted domestic terrorism. His reply was that his definition was the use of violence. His definition of domestic terrorism was the use of violence to quote, disrupt democratic processes. So an attack on a courthouse while in operation, trying to prevent judges from actually deciding cases that plainly is domestic extremism, domestic terrorism, he said. Right. And we can also extrapolate that to the January 6th, um, you know, attack on the the Congress. Uh, Then he goes on an attack simply on government property at night or any other circumstance is a clear crime and a serious one and should be punished. But he's saying, um, an act simply isn't terrorism if people or democratic functions aren't affected. Then he says, that's where I draw the line. He said, both are criminal, but one is a core attack on our democratic institutions. Very well put, I think. Sounds like he disagrees with Sacramento chief of police, uh, Daniel Hahn, about what constitutes <laughs> terrorism and what doesn't. Yeah, it does sound like that a little bit. And that he disagrees with Mayor Daryl Steinberg. Mm. Correct. Mm. I mean, and what do we do in these situations? It's like, like you're throwing around words like terrorism, which is like, we, you know, these conversations have been had over and over again, especially in the post 9-11 world where like that calling something terrorism or calling somebody a terrorist it can be an act of violence correct Mm -hmm. um can is in 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 certain circumstances it's an act of we there are different words that we can use aside from terrorism and terrorist that do not perpetuate cycles of harm um and when our own twisted ass government starts to use it for people who for just anyone when our own you know local elected officials people sitting in positions of power start using the word terrorist for people who are standing outside and protesting like this is problematic it's harmful that is violent Mm-hmm. There's also the blatant racism of this story too. Like, right. does, does anyone here know Timothy McVeigh's middle name? But nope. in this piece, we're immediately, uh, right. and it's it's hammered over your head over and over again what Joseph's middle name is, Mahmoud, right? And put this in the context of you know just coming after nine eleven, and you know exactly what the FBI is doing here, right? Right. Yeah, I mean it's it's the Barack Hussein Obama, right? Like, mm-hmm. right. 
you're you're trying to invoke people's feelings and it's 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 that's the way that that I think the dog whistling is so subtle it's like because then people turn around to you and say what I'm just saying his name right right <laughs> Like, and you, you can't argue back and be like, could you dare say the middle name? Like, right. you, you, like and then it, it's, it's, the, it's the process of, of really gaslighting you and making you feel like you are being unreasonable. I always, I always talk about how, like, so much of the racism is also the second guessing yourself about, like, is this really happening? Is it for these reasons? Because it's just so, like... Yeah, so it, it's a thing like noticing the middle name and then somebody says, why is that a problem? What did I do, right? And you, you're you trying to point it out to them and they're like, I was just saying his name, how dare you? And you're like now second guessing yourself, like maybe, the, I mean, it is his name. Like, how is that a thing? You know, like, huh, wink, I hate wink. it. I hate right. it, I hate it all. Well, yeah. yeah. I, and I think, um, I, I hope sort of the veil is lifting on all of this stuff right now. It's certainly yeah. a different world today than it was in 2001, um, where even folks at the Brennan Center for Criminal Justice are saying that this is this is really pumped up. You know, these people are just trying to call someone eco-terrorist so that that will make their career in the FBI right. because there's a lot more FBI agents on our soil than there are domestic terrorists. So we have a system where they're incentivized for creating a terrorist, for you know right. tagging the word onto something, or you yep. know putting somebody in a position where you know they feel like they're they're sort of led down this path towards you know agreeing to do an act, uh, as we've seen uh, over and over again in in the the Middle Eastern American community, right? Um, so I, yeah, I just, I think this is an interesting story. Uh, I, and I, I hope we do keep an eye on this uh, in the future because it, it's Sacramento local. Uh, and it's something that, uh, as we know, we still have far right extremists that are very violent in this country. And our government tends to point to leftists and claim that they are equal, but on the opposite side, when we know that's not true, we know which side is actually the violent side. Right. I think I think another thing too that ha that is happening is that there's the social consciousness is shifting a little bit. And I think more and more people are starting to wake up to like, hey, it kind of seems like when the government just declares war on something like drugs or terrorism or poverty or whatever, and they like declare a war on it and then like kind of like call it call it a day or like that's like so people kind of wake i think are starting to wake up to the fact that that's like like not not just like ineffectual because that makes it sound like like it had like the intentions were good in the first place but that the intentions right. with that sort of thing were never good and it's there's always an ulterior motive for the government being like oh we're now at war with terror which is yeah. like stupid on its face and also extremely insidious because it allows it allows them to move the goalposts on people who they want to move the goalposts on a la the war on drugs right we all know how that's shaping up yep. right yeah uh, by the way i just looked up timothy mcbay's middle name and it uh, turns out to be spike strip oh dang i, I hate it here <laughs> <laughs> that was so good well <clears throat> I love it here. I love it here so Same. much that I want more of this. I want as much of this wonderful content as I can possibly get my hands on. Um, you know, and and I, I, I love it so much. I listen to the show. I watch the show, you know. But I, if only there were, like, some kind of place that where everything is consolidated in an easy-to-find way, where, I, like, things you could, like, search for things that you wanted, you know, to find out if you talked about it or whatever. Where would I go for that? Uh, is there a place? And um, is there like some sort of way where we could maybe work out a deal where if I were to give you like, just like, I don't have much, but maybe like a few dollars a month, if I could have access to even more of this content, could we, is there a way that we could maybe make that happen? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Um, we at Voices River City are really working hard to build an infrastructure of perfect takes. 
um, just uh, bike paths of perfect takes that all lead to one place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that one place is called VoicesRiverCity.com. Uh, we've been around for four years. We've been doing news and arts coverage. We do the Sack Falls the Money Project, which is really fun and exciting. And um, we're trying to teach folks how to do that stuff too. So look out for future teach-ins on that as well. I've already done my first one uh, last month. And then, um, you know, the the site is mostly known for the podcast these days, but uh, keep an eye out for community essays, folks speaking truth to power. Uh, but what we're trying to do basically is is exalt uh, voices of people fighting the good fight, um, really pushing back against those in power, and and every day um, we're hoping to help help raise those voices a little bit more. Uh, you can actually every Tuesday. You can listen to us for free on all podcast platforms uh, on the radio on KUTZ FM 103.1 in Sacramento. Free. Uh, and then if you want, you can pay as little as $5 a month and you can get a free, well, not free, uh, you get a special Friday episode. And, um, you know, that every money Friday. goes towards every single Friday. Uh, so that's double the episodes for as little as $5 a month. Which is basically um, free. It's the closest thing to free you can get without it actually being free. It's like not it's scientifically verifiable information. Yeah. Facts. Basically free. Yeah. It's like a hot chocolate at the coffee shop you're not going to right now. Um, and even if you start going to it, it's too hot now for a hot chocolate. Yeah. What are you so, doing? What are you, what are you doing, you idiot? Yeah. Just spend it on Pour us, that bro. drink out and yeah. go home. And pour it into patreon.com slash Voices River City. Uh, we're also on the social medias uh, on Facebook, Voices River City, Twitter and Instagram at Voices River City. Instagram, super funny. Skylar runs that. I love it. Uh, I am on Twitter at Uno Kempa, Y-O-U, K-N-O-W-K-E-M-P-A. You can find me at guillotine for you. Uh, that is guillotine, the number four, Y-O-U. I'm Shan N D Stevens. And I am at Flojan, F-L-O-J-A-U-N-E. All right. Well, that'll do it for today. Um, if you are still sticking around and here at the end and the sign off, um, you are our favorite listener, uh, you specifically. And we and love you. The one and person. we want you to stay safe. Stay sane. Stay healthy. And stay away from me. Especially on those jump scares. <laughs> oh.